Yo, my peoples, what's up? Hola, que pasa, mi gente? Uepa. We Uepa. We have two Boricuas on the show today for the first time. I'm so excited. It is all Boricua all the time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I'll get into it. This is Jason. This is uh, Shelf Stories and also the One Stop Club Shop podcast. I am so excited. Uh, I have with me a designer uh, who designed a game about one of my favorite themes because I am Puerto Rican uh, and uh, this man is also Puerto Rican and he designed a game based on his heritage called Borinquen. We're going to go into that whole thing. But you may know him from other games. He designed Holy. A festival of Colors, uh, and a couple other things as well. So I am so pleased to welcome on the show, Julio Nasario. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jason. Uh, I appreciate the invite. I'm really excited to have this conversation because I also this is my first time uh, on on uh, uh, a podcast with another Puerto Rican. Really? You know, we're, we're, they're not a, there's not a lot of us in the board game mm. industry, so we should definitely appreciate when we have a conversation together for mm -hmm. sure. So I did uh, last year. I did uh, Latino content uh, content creators, a panel of us. So there's a whole oh. bunch of uh, Jazz Cruz, Roberto Lopez, uh, Yamigas, yep. um, Estefania, like so a, a bunch of the Hispanic creators. We got together. We talked about you know being kind of um, in, in the, the border, right? So like, we're all kind of border borderlands. So it's like, we have our heritage, but we're here in America and we're here in Geeky Games. <laughs> so we have yeah. to talk about that, so. Yeah, there's definitely a, a couple of us, funny enough, Jan Vegas and I, we go way back to high school. We we're oh, nice. since high school, so. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that uh, it, it, it's, uh, I would say it's always an advantage to come from a different culture because you have a different perspective, Uh, and especially with me as as when I started designing about five years ago, it, it that even because in Puerto Rico, you know, the, the board game industry is not that big right. is you know monopoly and scrabble and all that yeah. uh so it was kind of like a fresh yeah oh <laughs> domino briscas briscas uh, um so it was definitely a fresh start uh kind of fresh way of looking at game design and that has definitely helped me throughout this you know career hobby <laughs> absolutely you know and so we mentioned holy which is kind of a dexterity ish game that has all sorts of stuff to it it's oh, not oh no, no. Uh, um <laughs> No, uh, Holy is a, is an area control game that has three layered uh, boards right, it, from yeah. Floodgate Games. Yeah, the, the three dimensional uh, game uh, with uh, with a Hindu theme of all of all themes, which is a pretty interesting uh, thing that you did. Yeah, yeah. So uh, funny enough, um, that wasn't the original theme, uh, but the the it was a tree theme originally. But Floodgate Games had just released Bosk at the time. So they decided to go with that holy theme because the owner of Floodgate, he used to be a DJ and he would do these uh, uh, DJ events and uh, at the holy festivals and he really enjoyed it. But one of the things that he did that I really appreciated and it definitely it was the way to do it is that he had cultural consultants on mm -hmm. the team throughout the whole process and, and that made it a definitely a better game. All right. So we are going to get into all of that. We are here to talk about uh, your latest project, which is on uh, GMT's website. So we are Solo Gaming's podcast. Uh, so we, a few of us out in the audience would know about GMT, but maybe not everybody does. Mm -hmm. uh, so GMT, they publish historical games, war games, uh, and they have a very interesting publishing model. So maybe talk a little bit about the new game on a, on a, a high level, Boriken, and its relationship to GMT. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Boriken, uh, the Taino Resistance, is my game that's coming out from GMT Games. Taino. And <laughs> yes, so uh, Boriken is is based on the on the basically Boriken is the name of of current Puerto Rico, uh, as the Taino people called it, and the Taino people are the native uh, people from the from the island before the Spanish arrival. Um, And for me, it was definitely a theme that I was always very um, interested in, even living in Puerto Rico for the first 22 years of my life. Um, I, I always thought that it was uh, something that not many people talked about, uh, especially moving here to the States. And I work for the Forest Service uh, here in, in North Carolina, and I worked in Tennessee, and we actually dealt with a lot of uh, Indian reservations like the Cherokee. Uh, and, and dealing with them was definitely something that kind of opened my eyes to 
Well, you know, obviously the, the way they were treated and how things turned out for them wasn't the best, but at, at the end, c comparing it to Puerto Rico, right, and, and how the native Taino essentially uh, uh, were were disappeared for a moment there, and 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 they essentially in, were incorporated into what Puerto Ricans are today. Um, so uh, essentially, um, I I thought it was going to be a a good opportunity to to do this a couple of, you know two years ago, and and I designed this game as a as a way to teach people that are playing the Taino point of view um because that doesn't really happen often it's always kind of the conqueror or you know you have two equal parties uh, in a war um and i and i thought it would be interesting because even though they were natives and they were against a bigger opposition they still put up a fight um and what makes this game interesting is that it's actually one game that's divided into three separate experiences And these experiences are based on uh, the changes in the eras uh, of the Taino. So the first one is pre-1493. That's before the Spanish arrival. And it's actually what we call the, the arrival of the, of the natives to the island. So different cultures of different uh, uh, natives came into Puerto Rico and, and ultimately settled the island and, and became what, you know, the Taino in the Caribbean uh, mm -hmm. ultimately was. So that took, you know, hundreds of years to do that. So that's what people are doing. That this first one is a competitive game in which you're settling the island. That sounds very similar to a lot of things. Uh, now, the second uh, version of the game is from 1493, to 1511 and this one is from the spanish arrival and it's a cooperative game where you're trying to complete historical objectives while not trying to lose control of the island mm -hmm. and of course one of the main resources here is uh gold um and I, i thought it was very apt to use it as a resource that you would give to the uh, to the spanish so they could leave the island mm -hmm. but the more gold you gave the less there was available and the more Spanish that came back. Um, but the objective of this one is that you want to complete object, uh, um, different objectives from a deck of cards. Uh, you, you draw at least four and you're trying to, to uh, complete them before you lose control of the island. So it's very historically apt where you know it's going to happen. They're going to lose control of the island, but you got to make sure to complete these objectives before you do. Um, and then the last one is post-1511. Uh, and 1511 is a big one because it's kind of where the most of the uh, native and Spanish um, war kind of happened. Um, so after that, you know, the Taino lost. And uh, this post-1511 is a survival game, also a cooperative, where you're trying to escape the island because, you know, they had uh, lost in a sense and they were started doing guerrilla warfare and you're trying to uh, escape the island before you can't anymore and it's overrun. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, way of, of uh, you know, showing a game. Of course, all these can be played separately, but they can also be played kind of like a, in a campaign format. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, um, um, so I just wanted to interrupt for a second. You know, in the one-step co-op shop, we love a mechanism. So we're, I'm going to have you drill down on some of these mechanisms because um, you, I read on the uh, BG page, one of the forums said, this is three games smashed into one. And what you're describing is literally three games smashed into one. So help us understand that is it like three completely different mechanical experiences are the mechanical experiences that kind of like act as a through line through all three games what are we talking here no so essentially the base part of the game is the same the way the game interacts is the same you're essentially uh taino caciques which is the chief of the of the taino villages at the time um and and you're using this uh action track system because the caciques were both the political, military, and religious leaders of the Taino. Uh, so these are the three tracks that you're going to be, you choose one at the start of your turn and you complete the actions. There's base actions for each one. And then you use Taino cards, which is also a resource to complete even more actions on your turn. Um, so that's definitely the, the base system of the game. And then like there's a- card a, play type system? It's a board uh, play type system, okay. and you can also assign Nitainos, which is 
uh, like the, their lieutenants to in, even increase the, the, the amount of actions that you can do on, on each mm -hmm. track. And of course, as Taino, uh, you know, you have different beliefs. In this case, the Taino gods are also a mechanism in the game because it, th that's what they believe in. So what these gods do, definitely they change the game in a certain way. And of course, as caciques as well, we also have certain uh, powers. And of course, the main map is a map of Borinquen as it was uh, divided at the time and is divided into north, east, south, west and different locations. And, and there's a, a system that you you draw cards and they show you one of the locations and you add enemies to that location now the other side of the card however has uh where a lot of the historical uh subcontext comes in because there was a lot of different things in in the these times like of course like i said you you had uh um the spanish coming in and they were looking for gold but there was also uh slavery there was also the encomienda system which is a work for higher kind of well, work um exploitative work i mean it was a very yes. hierarchy like you know it's kind of like slaves but you know even the tainos were ahead of the africans the africans were total property and then the tainos were like kind of recognized a little bit it was a whole bunch of racist Ex hierarchical nonsense <laughs> yes so so it even that's you know that that's a big explanation right but in the system you have how these little things you have the ex a little explanation and then you get either a positive and a negative depending on what you action track you use that turn so for example like i have one that says forced labor and that's a negative for the religious track but then i have roads which is something that the spanish brought and that's on the military track a positive okay. so so it's something that uh that it's incorporated into the gameplay and it's not just text after text that you're reading. That's another thing because as a designer, I've always been uh, very language independent in my games. You can see that in Holy Festival of Colors and I also am the designer of Control from Pandasaurus Games. Um, I don't use a lot of text in my games. And of course, with historical games, that's uh, that's a, a tough line to follow, right? Because there's definitely a lot of information to bring forward. And there is definitely some of that. Um, but uh, a lot of my uh, system and historical context is incorporated into the mechanisms of the game. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, going back to what you asked, uh, the GMT P500. So uh, GMT picked up the game a couple of months ago, um, and their system, like you said, is very unique. They uh, We essentially kind of do some development on the background uh, to prepare it for the P500, but it's not the same as... Uh, development for uh, Kickstarter or something like that, because mm -hmm. they are not uh, doing any art just yet. Um, and there's still development to be done. And this P500 is a system where they pre-order, you put the game up to, to for pre-order. And it's kind of like a, like I said, like a Kickstarter. Um, and you're asking a certain amount of price. There's a P500 price. So if the game does come out later, it's going to be at a higher price. Um, and there the objective is to get to 500 pre-orders. Once that happens, it means that the game is going to be published. So that's like the goal, right? Uh, you want to get to 500 pre-orders to, to have the game be published. Um, and even after that, if you get to 750 or 1,000 pre-orders, that even pushes your game forward on their line because they have many active P500 projects at a time. Like right now, maybe they have 20, 25. Mm -hmm. um, Which is why we're doing this podcast, people. So we need to get some attention for this, uh, <laughs> this project. The more pre-orders, the more it kind of becomes prominent. And maybe we'll see, you know, better art and more development and more all, the, all sort of stuff. Yeah, and to that point, uh, that's definitely something that they've already planned on. So uh, they they already have a specific budget assigned for what the art's going to be, and they want to hire uh, uh, somebody that knows about the Taino culture and it has these resources to do the the art for the game and even having cultural consultants. I'm already kind of talking with people on the island that that are are basically part of the Taino Council in Puerto Rico. There's actually a community of people that consider themselves Taino because of their heritage and their the way they, they do the culture uh, there. And it's something that I've learned throughout this whole process, which has been really interesting. And they're totally behind the project, which I'm really excited. That's very cool. So uh, now secret, I work as a cultural consultant myself for uh, different 
uh, projects and everything. So talk a little bit about that. Talk a little about your um, experience with them. You said it's very, very positive. Um, I, I like to, when, I, when people ask, like, what is it? I, I like to say, it's kind of like a cultural editor, right? So like, they don't write the thing. They don't get into the design of the thing. It's just another look to see, okay, you know, this is this and that. And so, you know, that's my clinical explanation of it, but you've had direct experience. So talk about what the consultants have really brought to bring this to life. Yeah, so um, it, it is something that is fairly uh, early in the process, right? Because like I said, we're still, the, there's still development to be done in the game once it reaches that P500. Uh, but for me, essentially this, this whole uh, experience has been very interesting because uh, as we were talking before we started, I, I had my son be born last year in January, 2021. Um, and I didn't have a lot of time to design. I usually design a lot. And I, and I, there was this Zenobia award that was available and it's kind of like, it was a great experience and a great opportunity. So if you're from a, from a culture that you think it, it doesn't show a lot in games specifically historical games, I, I consider you check it out and they offer you mentors in the historical design community uh, to, to help you throughout this process. And I thought it was going to be a, a great opportunity. So of course, for historical games, I, even though, like I said, I lived in, in Puerto Rico for 22 years of my life, I didn't consider myself an expert on the topic. I definitely knew more than, than your average Joe. Um, so for that, I had to do a lot of research and, and talk with people. And one of the books that was recommended to me was uh, this one, Aguaybana El Bravo. Uh, Aguaybana is essentially like the, the most popular cacique in Taino, uh, Puerto Rican, Borinquen Taino culture. Uh, and and this is a, an interesting way of, because the historian in this book, he essentially went back to the, to the uh, source of the, of the historical references, because, uh, and I don't know much about how historians do their, their work, but uh, you essentially, a lot of times cite other historians from, mm -hmm. from, you know, the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and we're talking about 500 years ago. And um, one of the things that's been very interesting is seeing how the historians in the 1700s and 1800s were all Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and their point of view is, you know, is obviously very uh, subjective, uh, because they're from the point of view of the of victorious, right? Um, and, and the Taino were seen in a bad light from their perspective. Um, so this historian, uh, his name is Jalil Suet Badillo. He went to the uh, original text, original letters sent from people that were in the 1508 to their significant ones in Spain and, and learning how it really happened from those. Uh, uh, original sources. Um, and that was where I started. And if you see the video, this, <laughs> the, every page has a, 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 and I went through this thing front and back a couple of times because uh, I, I thought there's not really a lot of historical uh, text that could really help me in this process. And this was a big one that I, uh, that I really appreciated, yeah, but I mean of course, yeah, sorry. The Taino did not have writing, as we understand it. Uh, they had oral traditions, you know, so like if you, if they had preserved, were able to preserve the oral traditions, we would have this whole rich history. But unfortunately, because of the Spanish came in with their attitudes, <laughs> you know, uh, you know we, that a lot of that history was unfortunately lost to us. And the other thing is, and I found this out, I was reading a book on Cortes the, in Mexico, and so much of our historiography, our understanding of that time period is based on what the conquistadors wrote. And then yeah. to your point, you know, you go in 16th, 17th, 18th century, you know, so-called historians are looking back at those sources, you know, and they and they're, yeah. you know, they're talking about so look at like, of course, if you look if you look at Chris Columbus's journal, then it's gonna look like, you know, whatever it looked like. And he talked about the Tainos or, you know, they'd make fine servants, you know, or or whatever <laughs> the, the whatever the heck he said. Uh so it it's really only recently that we've had historians from the places themselves who have tried to go back even deeper and recover as much as possible. And it's a very difficult task. It involves multidisciplinary archeology, span uh, anthropology, all sorts of different things, but it's worth the effort to me because we get, yeah. uh, to your point, 
uh, at the very beginning of the show, different perspectives. Like we wouldn't even know these perspectives had we not have historians and other people do this really deep legwork. And that's where the cultural consultant comes in because in theory, they should be in touch with that deeper stuff. Yeah, with the, with the original source, right? Um, so, so, and based on this, I, you know, once the P500 was, was starting to come out and I started uh, showing it to people, especially in the island, um, I had, uh, I had this kind of information overload of the mm. different people and the different bands of people in the island because that's, that was very interesting you know like i said originally there's this uh native taino community there uh from the taino co council and there are people that they have essentially you know evolved using the the taino culture to modern day um and and that this whole uh, uh process has been very interesting for them because it one of the things that they told me that they've definitely done your research very well there's definitely a, a, a lot a couple of things especially when it comes to the art and and my geography on the map and stuff like that that of course you know as a designer prototypes are definitely something that you know they're not the best and i'm not an artist so stuff like that and i know that that kind of thing is going to be improved a lot uh once the game does if when it gets published um and and this whole uh uh having that support from them and even me telling them, hey, it, when the game reaches that P500, I want to make sure that uh, it is done well and I want you to be in this process and also having say in who the artist is going to be mm -hmm. because they they have a lot of great artists in this community. Uh, and again, they're not, uh, what do you call, like, they're, they're not just people that live in huts and, and taparrabos, they're, the, they're uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and bohillos, you gallegas, and, and there are people like you and me, and, and, and they have a, just a different culture, uh, well, a culture that they uh, believe in, the same as, as ours, um, so it's, it's been very interesting to go through that, and the conversations that we had, because I've learned so much. But one of the things that really hit me was uh, he was telling me that, you know, uh, as Puerto Ricans, we pride ourselves in the fact that we have, you know, Spanish, Taino, and African blood in our veins. Uh, but the, you know, the sad historical truth is that if you do have those three are, uh, in them is that at one point there was something, you know, there was maybe a, a, a slave that, you know, there was some, you know, what happened there and, mm -hmm. and, and it came out and, and I mean, let's I, just say I, it, there was there a lot of forced marriage. There was a lot of, yeah. you know, assaults. And especially like when the first, the Nina, the Pinta, Santa Maria, they were no women on those ships. You yeah. know, so it was all men that came over and it wasn't, and women didn't come over to the island, the, the Spanish one for a pretty long time. So you have, you know, matrilineal, a connection to some of the earlier, you know, some of the earlier places. And we're not going to, you know, we can't dwell on, you know, where that comes from. However, I like what you said in the, I think it was the PG, um, the, the description where you talked about like, you know, out of that, out of that, exactly. crucible, you know, what we did, you know, you can't change history. Right. And, I, and we yep. get this, we get this a lot, right. You mean, Oh, you want to erase history. You don't want to talk about difficult things. It's like, okay, how, you talk about the difficult things. Do you talk about them as just like, you know, do you just, you know, throw brutality at people and that's the end of the story? We don't want that. Do you no. lie, which is what, you know, Puerto Rico, the, the Euro game does, basically lies. Uh, and I've talked about that many times. Uh, you know, that We don't want that either. I mean, what the what the goal is, is to tell redemptive stories. Exactly. You know? And so you talked about the Taino resistance right there in the title. Yeah, exactly. So, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the, the official history, as, the, uh, as we call it, says that, you know, the Taino were easily, you know, overcome and mm -hmm. it wasn't much of a problem them in the island. There was some, a little resistance here, here and there, but that wasn't the case. Um, you know, there were, there were big battles in the island that took place between the natives and the, and the uh, Spanish. Um, and it is something that, uh, you know, ultimately you know they they lost the war right but there were a lot of big battle victories mm -hmm. along the way that aren't really recollected 
Yeah, in Santo Domingo, I think it was, uh, there was a whole fort, one of the first forts, Fort Navidad, was completely wiped out uh, mm -hmm. by the Tainos and the regular people. So, like, you know, they came back and there was nobody there. So, I mean, we'd never, ever read these stories. Yeah, yeah, and... And, and, and there's there's something to be told there, again, from the Taino perspective. And like you said, it's not really about erasing history. It's about looking at it from a different perspective. Because like I said, I am proud of being a, a Puerto Rican. And and I, I'm proud of being part Spanish and part Taino and part African. And I want to tell another side of that story because of that. Um, it is funny that you say that, that some people believe, oh, you want to you're attacking our culture in a certain way because that's you know even as the p500 came out uh some people that are more spanish centric uh mm -hmm. from a you know very mm -hmm. vocal minority kind of people that that were very you're attacking our our you know puerto rican that our, our Why puerto rican heritage bad guys oh my god yeah like um spirit island i got spirit island right over here uh if you're watching the video and i had there was a, a thread on the one player guild and they were like, this game is racist against Spanish people. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, Bobby, you got how many games do you have? How would you want them all? <laughs> yeah, so it was definitely something that hit me hard because I didn't think I was going to get that kind of opposition. Um, but ultimately, it kind of showed me life, that I'm... Welcome to my friend. Welcome to my life. <laughs> it ultimately showed me that I, I am, I think I am doing something right. Yes. Uh, you know, um, and and even if there is opposition, it, it just means that it is that much more worth it to keep pursuing this uh, 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 tool, because essentially this game is going to be I want it to be a tool that people can use to to educate uh, uh, others on on this uh, native culture, on, on this small island that uh, some people may or may not know. Uh, but ultimately it is a story that is worth telling mm -hmm. absolutely so let's circle back to the mechanisms while i have because i did one stop co-op shop people are going to want to ask me <laughs> uh, so the first game is purely competitive and if yes, i sir. read the and if they read the page that there that there isn't a plan right now for there to be a bot so then you have the first game which is competitive and then the next two games which are cooperative and they all and they have that one system that action track system but they're very different feeling uh i mean Talk about that a little bit, because I, I imagine that there are going to be some people that are going to want to solo the whole thing or, they're yeah. going to, you know, they're they resistant to the different experiences. They kind of want a more, um, you know, they want to feel more the same. So talk a little, bit, a little bit about, you know, what you think about that. And are you thinking about a bot and does it need a bot? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, like like you said, uh, the, the first uh, part um i would say the first uh, uh, version of the game is a competitive one in which uh players are trying to settle the island and i ultimately contribute to its discovery right um so there's a couple of, of little things that again that historical context that's just incorporated into the mechanisms that are you know you essentially start with a lot of tokens face down and and just by uh, completing actions on these locations, you just flip them. And they may come out to be cassava, which is the one of the resources that's uh, like a root vegetable in the island. But there may also be endemic uh, animals, flora or fauna that's only mm. found in Puerto Rico. Um, and that kind of stuff is, is it may ultimately just be a little picture here, uh, but it, it can have a deeper meaning to it. Now, the, the main thing that differentiates these games are essentially the, the goals and a couple of mechanisms that make it happen. So, for example, in the first one, like I said, you're trying to contribute to the discovery of the island. So you have a track. Well, 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 that's one part of it. Right. So there's a track on the top that uh, goes to 15. And, and this tells you how much you've contributed to that. So whoever makes it to 15 first, but that's just one of many goals that you can use to win the game. So another one is that you wanna gain control of the majority of the island. So three of the five uh, uh, sections, right? North, east, south, west, and, and center. Um, and then the other one is that you wanna build settlements on all the, all the different sections at least two settlements. So there's there going to be some comp some competition on on trying to go up that track, but at the same time trying to, trying to you know un, un, undercover 
build these uh, uh, boios along the island. And of course, there's some some battling involved as well, because mm-hmm. the Taino uh, ultimately came from many different uh, nati- native uh, cultures that came into the island. And that is something that was taught by the Taino council. And they mentioned, I can't really mention all the names here, but they they will be, uh, that will be part of the, of the game as well. You'll be a specific uh, uh, subculture that became the uh, Taino ultimately. Um, now for the other ones, um, and and I'll get back to that whole solo part on the first one, but on the on the second one where you like I said you're trying to uh, complete these objectives, uh, and this these objectives are a, a deck of twenty to twenty five cards that all incorporate in uh, specific times in, in in this history in this time frame things that happen that that should be mentioned mm-hmm. and and how do we get there and like you know there's the the uh assassinato the Juan Salcedo, which is kind of the legend of you know the taino treated the the spanish as gods mm-hmm. um and at one point uh the group of taino they they uh drowned uh uh Juan Salcedo um and that's not a and, god look at he can't join a god <laughs> exactly exactly so that's one of the uh, historical objectives that you stuff like that and and again like the different battles that happened and it, and is the, it a war game like is this is this an actual war game or are you kind of invoking it no um it, i would say it's more like an euro uh game um because ultimately these games they all last from 45 minutes to an hour and a half and there are uh, there there is a, a battle component that uses just two dice, one that represents the the enemy and one that represents the Taino. And of course, you're using the tokens that you have there versus the enemies that I have there. So there is some luck in, in, luck into that. Uh, but of course, you can mitigate that luck as well. Um, but uh, battles are not really the main uh, component here. It is definitely uh, a, a part of it but not the the main one. And again, like I said, there are a lot of resources that you deal with. There's the cassava, there's the gold, and ultimately the Taino as a resource as well. Mm -hmm. Because all these games as the cooperative aspect, if you run out of Taino, you lose as well. It's Mm -hmm. not just because that's also a very thematic thing because uh, one thing on the P500 that I stated is, and this is a very historical, is that be, when the Spanish arrived in 1493, there was an estimation of there being about 15,000, uh, 50,000 uh, Taino in, in the island. And by uh, 1528, 40 years later, um, there were about less than 500, um, which is, it's a lot. And, and it's, it's not like to say that, you know, the, the Spanish all wiped them out because a lot of the big reason why they went down so quickly was also disease you know they 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 were not uh, their bodies were not meant to get all these diseases that the the spanish brought in one go right Mm -hmm. uh but of course there was a lot of uh uh, other things again the encomienda system and of course the ones that were a resistance uh to this that ultimately you know died fighting as well um so so yeah that's and of course the track uh that i mentioned on the on the competitive one is also a big part on the second one but in this one this track is going to change so that's one of the things that changes between games is this track and like i said earlier this track represents the gold track which is a big one because the spanish are a big opposition and they're gonna be taking over the island fast and you're trying to complete these objectives before they don't and one of the ways to get rid of them besides attacking is to give them gold and like i said the more gold you give them that's the track goes forward <laughs> yeah exactly the drag goes forward they go away mm-hmm. but the then the more spanish are coming in in future turns um and and ultimately that's that's how you want to win this uh second version completing these historical objectives and of course the 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 second the last one is like i said the survival aspect and in this one the taino have lost control of the island and at this point what you're trying to do is just gain enough control to to escape um and essentially uh the, this is where if you lose all your taino and and then this other one as well you you lose the game and also if you can't even place any any more uh uh boios you lose the game so it's very 
there's a lot of ways to lose and only one way to win. You want to escape the island. So you're using your Taino resource, you know, cards to, to go through the different five sections, right? So you're trying to gain control of that section for just enough time to be able to escape with, with the cards that you have and trying to collect them that way. Um, and of course, this is a very cooperative aspect of it as, as well. And as an interesting aspect as well is that you every player has a cacique card that has a special ability that you can use in the game. But uh, once per game, and it is once per game because you're sacrificing your cacique, to essentially uh, remove all the opponents in that location uh, because multiple regions have, uh, some regions have multiple locations. So it's very strategic in that way. And then, you know, obviously, obviously it's a sacrifice worth uh, doing it for, for your culture to live on. And ultimately it did, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's all, you know, it's not just about the theme and the historical aspect, right? But it is all there as part of, these mechanisms that coincide very well in the game. Um, of course, with the cooperative ones, uh, they can be played solo. Um, and uh, it, I would say uh, it really doesn't change the difficulty much because all the winning and losing factors are based on the card decks and, and stuff like that. So the, the number of players doesn't really affect that. I would say maybe playing solo could be a little more difficult because you have uh, less access to the island, but there are different actions like the canoe action that you can do uh, and you can move on the island. There's some thematic sense on, on all of these. And of course, I didn't mention that on the, on the survival game, the closer you get to that track, which is how many Taino have escaped, the less actions that you are available to you. Uh, because historically, the Taino were losing uh, essentially their, their people and their culture and stuff like the canoe was being lost because they were actually taking them away from them. So they couldn't move on uh, along the island and they couldn't escape. Um, they had and, some and, really good canoes. We're talking like 50, 100 people canoes. But it, we're not just talking like two little people on the thing. No, no, like exactly, they, like exactly. They sailed all of the Caribbean. Like they would just go to Cuba and, you know, and like it was... It, they, we we think about it as islands, but they thought about it as like their territory. And they yeah, part. Easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so essentially, the the both cooperative games can be played solo, and the the competitive game is is meant to to kind of teach players, and uh, of course, it's a fun part to kind of win, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Because as part of the campaign, and we haven't gone into that yet. Uh, that if you do play it as a campaign that connect, whoever wins this first one could get the the Aguaybana uh, mm -hmm. Casigue card, which is kind of like a stronger, a little stronger than all the others, which could you know could be interesting in a way. <laughs> but um, uh, it is something that at, at this point it could definitely be beneficial because I know that people solo gaming is something that has been a big resurgence in the last couple of years. Um, and having a bot uh, that could essentially compete against you in, in the competitive competitive one, it, it's not too far off, I would say, um, essentially because this game system is so tight-knit that um, adding something that's simple enough to, to have that opposition and having a goal for you to complete before the bot does something is something that I, I can definitely see happening, uh, but Ultimately, we gotta get that support and get that game funded, um, and 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 then we can get there because uh, it is something that it's very it's very different to what I'm used to as a designer, but I am completely 100% behind it. It is uh it is a small niche in the industry, right? Um, but it is one that uh that is worth pursuing for sure. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very excited. You know, when I first heard about it, I think you announced it on Twitter uh what is it last week or something like that at this point uh and you know got my pre-order in and there's a couple of pre-orders actually on the gmt uh five because they they make interesting games like just other oh, zenobia awards i'm definitely um into like different voices different perspectives and mechanisms like you know like everything you're talking about just seems you know pretty unique like when you have a unique theme it challenges designers to come up with unique solutions to you know bring those out that's how you get different themes no more deck yeah. building, please. No more worker placement. <laughs> Different stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
yeah and at this point you know we're we're almost halfway there uh it's not like we're we're i i do think it's gonna happen but again the faster it happens and the more people that are supporting it i think the the better support is gonna get overall but ultimately i think gmt is gonna do a great job because this is what they do and they do a good job behind these historical games for sure yep so there's gonna be a link to the p500 in the show notes to here uh on the video and on the podcast so uh please uh you know when this you know, when this totally rolls out and, you know, maybe we can get a, because I know you have the Mata TTS as well. Yes, yes. That's definitely something that once the P500 hits, they're going to be asking for play testers to, to help with the whole development process. And 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 and, and the more people that there are, the, the better it's going to be, the more different uh, uh, um, points of view uh, are going to help as well. And we're up for, for, for all the help we can get on that. Absolutely. So uh, all that stuff is going to be in the show notes. Uh, Julio Nasario, I love when designers take on passion projects. It was a perfect time with the young kid and <laughs> everything. <laughs> you got a lot more coming out because I know uh, you, you, you have the ball rolling on that. But this one in particular, I'm so looking forward to. So thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, and thank you all for the support. If you can change your money, change the world, people. So until next time, buenas noches. Buenas noches.